sports. They're a pastime for some, a lifestyle for others. For most of our listeners, they are the thing that the normal members of their families watch while they are editing the Assassin's Creed wiki during Thanksgiving. But beyond that, they are a vital tool for statecraft. In a long overdue and uh, much requested return, uh, we are joined today by Kareem Zidane, who uh, has written extensively on the many connections between sports, international politics, the use of sports by malign state actors, and the new forms of diplomacy emerging from modern trends in sports investment. Uh, Kareem, thank you for joining us today. Well, hey, Felix. I can't believe it's been five years, I think, since the last time I've been on Chapo. Can you believe that? Yeah, holy shit. I was like, (laughs) when I was putting our notes together, I was like looking up your last appearance on the Patreon. It was fucking 2017. Oh my God, six years ago. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. It like made me feel old. I was like, fuck, (laughs) how? It felt like more recent than that. Fuck. (laughs) I know. So much has happened since then. Like while while I was writing the questions, I, I was like, "Holy shit!" I can't ask him to recap like six years of Kotarov. <laughs> like we'd be here all day. Oh yeah, no, we really would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we will get to that eventually. But Kareem, uh, since you you know you you write a lot about um, uh, sports washing, that's something we talked a lot about on your last appearance. But instead of that. I'm sort of curious to know um, sort of about the uh, MMA world's response to Gaza. Could you talk a little bit about what's been going on with uh, active roster UFC fighters and the sort of weird dance that Dana White has been doing with UFC flag policy? Oh, no, absolutely. And I really think just for your listeners to have some background on this, to understand the contrast between the UFC and the, the response from its athletes versus, uh, you know, mainstream sports in the United States. Uh, I, let's go back and say just right after the attacks happened on, on October 7th, uh, I think the responses were immediate from, say, LeBron James, the NBA, you know, Major League Baseball, other major U.S. leagues. They immediately released all these statements saying they stand with Israel. And they made no mention of Palestine then, of course. And, you know, in the month or so thereafter, as the death toll continues to rise, they, they've still made no statement with regards to Palestine. So the hypocrisy is quite striking there. So it, it's, it's interesting to me that even the fans at that, at that point were responding to LeBron James. I remember one comment that was really interesting was that, 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 that the picture of Malcolm X was posted uh, to LeBron James, and it said what part? It was a picture of I think him reading Malcolm X's autobiography, and the the comment said, "What part of Malcolm X's autobiography told you that it's okay to support oppression?" So that's kind of the 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 incidents happening in the mainstream, and you've got of course like flag banning taking place in in the MLS and elsewhere, and they say that it's just general flag ban- banning that you can't bring in any national flag, but I mean, it's all occurring right after the October 7th attack and as we're into this Gaza war. So, I mean, it's very clear what's actually happening. So let's contrast that with what's occurring in the UFC. Very quickly, you had UFC fighters speaking out. I mean, and you could see the tribalism almost immediately there. You had the vast majority of the Muslim fighters. I mean, your Dagestani contingent from Khabib Nurmagomedov to Islam Makhachev, etc. And the list goes on to Hamza Chimaev from Chechnya, all responding straight away, putting out statements in solidarity with Palestine to one extent or another, uh, really coming out in full, full-throated full support for Palestine. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, Natan Levy, who's an Israeli UFC fighter, coming out in very, very strong support for Israel. I think things have since... Uh, <laughs> uh, descended uh, from then on, unfortunately. Let's let's go back to a couple of uh, UFC pay-per-views ago. So UFC 294 took place in Abu Dhabi, and that card featured Islam Makhachev in the main event and Hamza Chimaev in the co-main. So here's two interesting that two interesting things that happened at that event. Hamza Chimaev uh, won his fight and then proceeded to give this sort of uh, post-fight uh, speech in the octagon, where in English he called for peace. Just a general, you know, ambiguous call for peace, really not referencing anything specific, nothing incendiary in any way, shape, or form. Hey guys, Salam Aleikum Abu Dhabi. <laughs> guys, you know what's happening in the world now, right now? 
I wasn't happy in the cage. Fight this week. Oh, see the kids dying. It doesn't matter. Whatever in the world, Ukraine and Syria, Afghanistan, Palestine, you said, doesn't matter. When kids die, it's hard, guys. I love the kids. And then he takes the mic from Joe Rogan and turns and starts speaking in Chechen. Thanks to my country, Chechnya. So the translation to what he said in Chechen was, first of all, he was uh, uh, speaking directly to Ramzan Kadyrov, calling him his chief and saying, uh, please send me to Palestine. I want to die in Palestine fighting with my brothers. So that was his actual statement in Chechen. You see the contrast between that to what he said in English. Islam Makhachev, on the other hand, also had sort of a much simpler sort of uh, I stand with Palestine statement after his fight, and he was uh, draped in a Palestinian flag as well. Interestingly enough, all that was edited out of the YouTube footage that the UFC later posted online, which I mean, you want to talk about hypocrisy, UFC that claims to be, you know, willing to stand for any politics and uh, has, has been very open about letting its fighters speak out in support of, say, Donald Trump, right? But when it came to Gaza, that's where they seem to have drawn the line when it comes to Palestine. So another example of how things have sort of deteriorated in, in mixed martial arts is there is an Israeli uh, MMA fighter. His, na- his name is Haim Ghazali. And he goes by the Israeli Batman. He used to once fight for Bellator. So he posted some really pretty disgusting photos on Instagram at one point. One of them was of an artillery shell that he had inscribed with the names of Muslim MMA fighters, mainly Khabib, uh, Islam Makhachev, uh, Hamza Chimaev, and the Palestinian UFC fighter Bilal Muhammad. So we're seeing some pretty awful things taking place in MMA in a way that's just in mainstream sports, a lot of athletes are staying silent. I've only really seen uh, Michael Bennett in the, uh, from the NFL actually speak out, and he's a retired athlete anyway. Uh, many athletes are, 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 are saying that they just don't want to put out a statement for one reason or another, but here is the UFC, and I mean, the UFC has never been shy of controversy, and there's tons of it to go around right now, Felix. I saw the thing with um, Red and Defender's name on the artillery piece. That was just fucking shocking. Mm-hmm. I thought the specific thing that happened with uh, Islam Makachev and the and the the flag was particularly interesting because I did see some people on Twitter like you know uh, most people watch this through pay per view in America, but it's televised through TV deals in some other countries. And I did see some people say while this was going on that they didn't televise like. Uh, you know any any part where he was displaying the flag or like the walkout and this like it was sort of one of those perfect ufc things that happens where dana kind of paints himself into a corner because you remember like about a month before uh the attacks dana made this big show about how like the um the flag band's fucking stupid we're Mm -hmm. done with we're, we're done with it and First of all, like he's the one who instituted it. <laughs> like he's he he's acting like some invisible higher up told him to do it. No, he's the single person behind the flag ban policy. And he was like, "If you're offended by a flag, fuck you." <laughs> and then, of and course, he wouldn't give any like, reasons. Remember, he wouldn't give any reasons either as to why he was banning the flag. He's like, "Oh, you know why." And then the same thing happened when he unbanned it. People are like, "Well, what happened? What changed?" He's like, "Oh, you know why? What you know? What changed?" <laughs> it's, it, it's like, well, "Well, give us an answer." Yeah, yeah, no, it just it it defied reason. And of course, like, yeah, they edited out like any reference to Palestine. I mean, I understand them not broadcasting the message to Kadyrov. Actually, that was the only one that was broadcast, believe it or not. What? I'm not even kidding. I believe even if you go back to the YouTube page, at least at the time when I was writing my article about it, that Chechen translation was still live and online. I think... If I have to guess, really, when it's stuff like this, when it comes to UFC, it's always incompetence, really. And I think they just didn't have a translation. They assumed it was nothing important, and they just let it hang there for a while. And I know it definitely aired live because I I, I watched it. So, yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. Yeah, no, I mean, I knew it aired live, but, like, it, the fact that it's in, like, replays and stuff is, like, 
you would figure that they would have at least someone on staff who speaks Chechen. After all this time, <laughs> after so many, like so many Chechen linked and Dagestani fighters have dominated, like all the all these divisions, they would have someone who could go, "Hey, uh, <laughs> listen to what this guy said." They definitely have, uh, even when it came to Dagestani, they're always lucky with regards to the translator because it was usually Khabib's, uh, his, his other manager, not Ali Abdulaziz, the Egyptian, but the, but the other manager, Rizvan Magomedov, is Dagestani. So they'd usually have him in the octagon translating for them. But I don't think they've had ever really anybody translating Chechen for them. And yeah, it's, this is a great example of where it, it, it worked out against them. Yeah, I think like in general... Just like in the institutional sports world, as you, you talked about earlier, there is a, a policy towards like Israel, Palestine, and it's a pretty codified, pretty um, well articulated policy of just either not touching it or showing like overt support for Israel. Whereas with the UFC, it's like they're trying to do the same thing as you know, any other major sports league or, or a uh, team or anything, but it's, they're just like too incompetent to even pull that off. It, it, the result is just like pure incoherence. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's very characteristic really for, for the UFC to display this level of incompetence with something like this, but also the hypocrisy is so stark, Felix, at the same time, when you think of just last weekend at the most uh, recent, uh, pay-per-view event that they had they had it, it took place in madison square garden and at one point you had donald trump walk out with dana white with kid rock with tucker carlson and with donald trump jr <laughs> that's a political <laughs> statement right there and they're mad about gaza seriously <laughs> yeah and dana whenever dana talks about trump it's always the same thing it's like hey you know when we just uh had first bought the ufc uh, and we were, you know, we didn't know if this would work out. Donald Trump came to one of our events in Atlantic City, and that was huge. And so he tries to characterize like supporting Trump as like overtly non political. So, like, this is this is just his friend who really did him a solid like 20 years ago. That's and that's something it's it's almost like a lie. He's only trying to pass off to sports fans and the MMA media, because honestly, it's not like he's not making appearances regularly on Fox, you know, at variety of shows from Sean Hannity to Tucker Carlson. I mean, he had Tucker Carlson do like a three part sit down with him and they went to his office and Tucker Carlson like was going to have an orgasm over the random like things in in Dana White's uh, office at the time, uh, the the connection between the UFC, Dana White, and and uh, Trump's you know GOP is very very uh, clear, and I don't think they've ever really attempted to hide it very much. If anything, they've just taken advantage of it to make it part of the brand. They see themselves as apparently counterculture, right? And this is the they figured out their target audience in the United States, and that really hasn't changed since the UFC was taken over by Endeavor. If anything, the UFC under Ari Emanuel has become even more overtly political uh, between its relationship with with uh, with with Donald Trump and onwards in other countries. I mean, it's opening itself up to other markets now between China, between Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, an established partnership there. So they have no qualms with working with. Uh, you know, autocrats and authoritarian regimes around the world. It's so interesting because like that sort of like pro Trump, like this general universe of content, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. like pro Trump or Tucker or like Barstool, a certain type of like male demographic they're going for. Right. Mm -hmm. And being like overtly pro Israel isn't really like part of that set of things, even if Trump himself as president was, you know, incredibly pro-Israel. Uh, you know, he uh, moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He did all these things. But just as a cultural thing, that's not really part of it anymore. But it's so weird that, like, they embrace this this branding of, like, controversy and, like, you know, fuck your feelings. But they're just terrified of pissing anyone off by mm -hmm. like acknowledging this like it just acknowledging that anything is happening in gaza it, like having any of their fighters even show concern it, it, it really just yeah makes them 
look terrified. Well, it, it does because I mean they're 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 walking a very strange tightrope here, aren't they? By trying to expand the brand and grow it and really present themselves as mainstream, building sponsorships and partnerships, uh, unlike they've ever done before. I mean, the UFC is uh, is far more profitable than it's ever than it's ever been. It makes well over a billion dollars in revenue a year. That's that's incredible for for the organization. It does that off the back of you know exploitative labor of fighters at the end of the day, but. Uh, this has long been uh, the UFC's brand, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, change very much here, really. Yeah, yeah. Like, the brand is sort of like the appearance of boldness or the mm-hmm. appearance of not caring, when in fact these are people who, you know, like anyone with a multi-billion dollar business, care very much. Exactly, exactly. But I mean... Uh, Dana White's still going to get go off. And I think he just recently said that uh, sponsors were very mad, or one of his main sponsors, he didn't cite who in the UFC, was very upset about, uh, D- D- uh, I think it was the Donald Trump walkout or something like that. Uh, and Dana White, apparently, he told the media, he's like, I told that sponsor to go fuck himself. So, I mean... <laughs> I wonder if that's something that Dana White's going to get a talking to from, you know, Ari Emanuel afterwards. Or because to me, it just still seems like Dana's operating as if this is the old UFC under the Fertitta brothers, where it was all about them being niche and fighting back and, and standing up to the man, etc. But I don't think they realize just how, how much they've just become the man in that sense now, really. Like they are a corporation like no other, from the exploitation to the pursuit of of, of, of profit at the expense of absolute anything else that is the ufc through and through and uh donald trump fits perfectly into that and i mean he is this is a mutually beneficial thing it's not just like it's just the ufc that's benefiting from this i mean i don't know if you got to see this felix but a couple of months ago uh donald trump sat down for an interview with the the, the ufc podcast thing called ufc unfiltered it was with matt sarah and I can't remember the other guy that... that, that uh, Jim worked. Norton. Yeah, that's exactly it. Jim Norton and, and Matt Sarah. And the whole interview, what struck me about it is I... Because I sat down to watch it thinking he's going to just take this over and make it political. But actually, there wasn't a single mention of politics whatsoever. It was a sit down where he talked about his love of, you know, boxing, his favorite boxers back in the day, his experiences with Mike Tyson and whatnot. You look at the comment section beneath that in the YouTube clip or anywhere else really where it was shared... And a lot of the comments say, oh, my goodness, I didn't realize Trump was so knowledgeable about the sport. It's so cool to see a president who's this knowledgeable. I mean, Trump is benefiting in a multitude of ways. His relationship with the UFC presents him, I mean, if you can even believe this, as sort of this this masculine figure, as a show of strength to a certain extent. I mean, it, it, that, that only really works on a certain audience. I look at it and I roll my eyes, and I'm sure you do as well, but it works on some people. And then at the same time, he's able to reach out to this more apolitical audience in the first place that's not even interested in listening to politics but is a, it finds it appealing that one of these actual political figures out there is just another guy just like them and can shoot the shit about you know Mike Tyson and stuff like that so it's effective strategy and combat sports somehow falls into part of the presidential campaigning as it's done for the last two elections it's crazy yeah and uh that yeah that Trump appearance on the UFC podcast that's a very efficient just in a nutshell, that's kind of what sports washing is at the end of the day in its most base vulgar form. It is using sports uh, so that a very not normal entity, whether it is a country or just an individual politician doing it, so that they appear as normal. Like that really is it. It's just whether it's Saudi Arabia doing it or Donald Trump, it's a way for someone or uh, some place that's incredibly weird and unrelatable to appear as such. Absolutely. It's a phenomenal uh, form of reputation laundering. And for, and for Donald Trump, it works great. I mean, especially at a point where he's facing all sorts of charges and, and, and court cases and hearings and in the lead up to an election. It's a great time to win over a generally growing, you know, nihilist and 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 apolitical and apathetic base that exists out there. I mean, you look at the world and the state of the world, it's not exactly like everybody's psyched up to go vote right now. So he's appealing to people in a very different way. Whether it works long term or not, that's really not my specialty here. But I did find that interview very interesting because it was also unlike any of the ones he's done before, Felix, really, even when he's 
He's always had Dana White come to his rallies, for instance, in Las Vegas, etc. And he'll introduce him and talk about, oh, Dana made a lot of money and I've helped Dana make all this money. It always comes down to me and what I've done, which is, which is Donald Trump's way. I mean, he's a narcissist mm-hmm. through and through. Textbook narcissist. But this really was a very different interview from him. So um, he's either got phenomenal PR people working with him. And I believe actually someone from the UFC... Uh, formerly worked with the UFC's communication team, is actually a member of Trump's campaign right now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, So there's another connection for you right there. That might really be how this is being linked. But uh, it's either that or he's realized he needs to evolve his strategy a little bit here. Yeah, and there's sort of an incredible parody between him and the UFC, both in, you know, how you said that the UFC has this branding of, like, you know, we're not not some pussy ass normal fortune 500 company we know you know fuck your feelings uh we don't care what sponsors we offend when at the end of the day they conduct themselves exactly as like you know any other massive company you could think of would trump is the same way where he has this branding of uh not being of being an outsider but in reality in actual practice as a as the president he was for the most part like any other like bad republican president you would have <laughs> i mean yeah i mean that that that's uh that's like maybe that's birds of a feather right there why dana white and donald trump relate to each other so much right yeah, I mean, yeah. at this point they're in each other's company a lot so there must be something beyond sort of the the let's get, let's get that picture for for our fan bases there's clearly something there between them Call it a bromance yeah. of sorts. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's no uh, doubt about it. And I mentioned him a little earlier, but you didn't know he was here. I just said, you know, he's a champion. He's a winner. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. He's a tough cookie. He's the kind of people that made our country great. Truly, they made our country great. He started off with two people fighting each other. Then he got four people fighting each other. Then he got a fighting each other, each other. Then he got six and eight and 12. All of a sudden, people started watching and looking. And I was proud to hold his first event. That's why he loves me. I fought, they didn't want, they said it's too dangerous. Nobody would take it. I'm the only one who said, take it. We'll take it. And he has been my friend for a long time. He's the UFC president. And they just sold the company. He started it off for about $30. And they just sold it for $4 billion. And the people that bought it said, we're not buying it unless Dana White stays back and runs it. So Dana White, come on up. He's now a very wealthy guy. Come in. Well, let's segue now into um, the part of the world that um, last time you were here, the UFC already was doing a lot of business here, but... Things seem to have exploded in the last few years, especially. I was reading some of your articles about uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, sports strategy, and um, I noticed that you made a distinction between, um, you know, sports washing, which Saudi Arabia definitely does, and a more a, a more sophisticated form of like statecraft that they're doing through sports. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how their strategy has evolved with their sports investment? Because they, they, they've they been making major moves in the last three years alone. Oh, absolutely. So it's funny, actually, that you asked this question, because I was just in Michigan at, in Ann Arbor giving a lecture exactly about this topic, the evolution of Saudi sports strategy from 2016 on to where we are in 2023 now, and how this has really gone beyond sports washing. So as we mentioned, sports washing, if we're defining it as, you know, uh, governments using sports or weaponizing them uh, as a form of, you know, distracting from human rights abuses or as a form of reputation laundering. Well, that was really only Saudi strategy, I'd say, for the first few years. Let's say up until 2019, 2020. Uh, and I'll explain why. That was really at the point, if you remember, Felix, uh, the, with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman, he went on this sort of reform campaign in the United States, didn't he? He was welcomed yeah. in open arms, really, by all mainstream medias. They all called him the reformer. You know, Saudi's about to change dramatically because of this reformer. And then came 
you know, the the assassination and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi. And that really damaged that, that image, at least for a few months. It really put a dent into that image. But what Saudi had at the time, really interestingly, was a relationship with the WWE. And when we talk about entities that are led by, you know, uh, interesting characters like Dana White for the UFC, well, Vince McMahon in the WWE is definitely one that you have to mention. And uh, another person who has a phenomenal relationship with Donald Trump. But the WWE had just held its first event in Saudi Arabia in April 2018. And that event was a complete propaganda showcase. I mean, we're talking now about scripted entertainment rather than sports. So they were really able to dedicate the show to showcasing Saudi Arabia as a reformed and evolving and changing nation. And I mean, they had opened up the stands to families and to women, etc. So it was a great way to really emphasize that point. And every once in a while, they'd stop the broadcast to take you around Jeddah or Riyadh and talk about the tourism and the opportunities, etc. And at one point they had, you know, the WWE found its two it's two Persian, like American wrestlers. It's two wrestlers with Irani origins, brought them out, you know, paraded them to the stage to booze from the crowd. This is at the point still when Saudi Arabia still had plenty of tension with, uh, with Iran. And then they brought out two local Saudi wrestlers to kick their asses. And I had never seen oh my such God. an overt display of propaganda on a WWE show. It's a, still a show like any other show that you're paying for to watch as an American. And you're paying for complete, utter Saudi propaganda. I mean, that's how powerful that relationship was. And to put this into perspective for people, the WWE is reportedly being paid upwards of $50 million per show they do there. That's more than the gate they make for their WrestleMania event, which is the biggest event WWE does. So safe to say, really, Felix, that WWE had a lot at stake here. So their second event was scheduled for November 2018, which was just a few weeks after Khashoggi was assassinated. And... Uh, the State Department tried to step in and the U.S. officials tried to step in to stop the event from happening to really, you know, try and convince Vince McMahon not to go forward with the event. But he ended up announcing saying, you know, we have a deal with Saudi and we're about to go through with it. And they did. They went back in November and acted like everything was perfectly normal, held a second propaganda show and it was all fine. That was, I'd say, the height of Saudi sports washing for me, the way I visualize it, because Despite the fact that uh, Saudi was facing, Saudi government and Mohammed bin Salman was facing probably the biggest smear to his uh, or stain to his uh, facade that he had built, uh, he still was able to convince these sports organizations to come and to normalize, to continue to normalize the country. That was the boon for them at the time. And thereafter, they started holding major boxing events, uh, including big heavyweight showdowns, right? Like Saudi Arabia is a mm-hmm. huge boxing uh, hub now, I'd say. Uh, you know, the Formula One started coming over. Uh, they started holding bo- uh, golf events as well, right? It started coming in from there. And eventually, they b- they bought... Uh, they managed to take complete a takeover of Newcastle FC from uh, the English Premier League in the 2021. And apparently the Premier League was given these legally binding assurances that Saudi state would not be involved. But the entity that purchased Newcastle was the Public Investment Fund, which is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, which currently has well over $800 billion to just spend and invest right there. And it's chaired by Mohammed bin Salman. So the idea that there's a distinction between the Saudi state and its sports strategy is absolutely ridiculous. But here's where a lot of people would say, well, the Newcastle example is sports washing. Felix, I think it's a bit more complex than that. Just when you buy a football club, you've managed to inherit a legion of loyal fans who are now not just a willingly buying the idea that you are a great country. That's step one. But they are now active participants in it. They are not only just complicit, but many of them are willing propagandists for Saudi Arabia. There are entities in Newcastle that call themselves the Saudi boys now, right? Have thought full on, they'll go to the events wearing the thobs and the whole thank you Saudi Arabia. They're very delighted with what's happened. And it's hard to blame a lot of these uh, fans because Newcastle was in a really tough state in the English Premier League, and I mean, ended up finishing fourth last season, is in the Champions League now, and is doing quite well for itself. So, I mean, some people would say, well, you know, it was worth it, but that's what Saudi Arabia is trying to do. It's buying influence at this point. It's buying your silence either through, you know, uh, checkbook diplomacy, truly just flat out checkbook diplomacy. Seriously, just uh, I will pay, I will pay you to to like me. 
And that's what Saudi Arabia <laughs> did with Newcastle United. But since then, it's expanded even more. They're just getting the 2034 World Cup, and that came to them with no votes. I mean, people were in uproar, Felix, in 2010, when Qatar got it, and we're talking about briefcases of money being exchanged, and the vote was rigged, and all sorts of reports came out. People were in uproar then. Saudi Arabia got the World Cup in 2034 without a vote, without any formalities, just by Gianni Infantino, the FIFA president, announcing it's going to Saudi Arabia after they did everything possible to rig the 2031 so that nobody could compete in 2034. By that, I mean that in 2030, the event's going to take place between Morocco, uh, Portugal and Spain. And then there's also going to be three matches taking place in Latin America, which now puts those continents out of the running for the following World Cup because you're ineligible to once again bid on the, the following World Cup, leaving only a handful of confederations possibly competing with Saudi Arabia, primarily Asia, which is where Saudi's bid is, and Oceania, which has New Zealand, which is not really going to be a football nation, is it? So Saudi Arabia was just given this silver platter, gold platter actually, to just completely come and take over the sport. That's what it's really doing here. So beyond the fact of sports washing, when we're talking about basic reputation laundering, I really think Mohammed bin Salman has reached a point where he doesn't care anymore. We're seeing uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's human rights abuses actually go up right now. We're seeing really cruel and harsh prison sentences being handed out for people tweeting anonymously, just tweeting their discontent with the state of affairs. And it might not even be a very political tweet. Some of the tweets I saw are very tame, but they're handing down sentences that are harsher than in Egypt, where I come from. And that's really, really saying something, right? But yeah, yeah, you know, it's like it, I could. This is the type of thing. I mean, like I said, I just gave a lecture on, on this, and I spoke for ninety minutes straight. So this is the kind of thing that if you let me go, Felix, I won't stop. So jump in and no, no problem, <laughs> no, no problem at all. No, I think this is like fascinating because like I've never like really followed pro wrestling, but their relationship with the WWE, as you pointed out, it seemed like it was sort of like their partner of last resort. Like mm -hmm. that was. That was the only like major sports or sports entertainment brand that they could get to like still work with them after the Khashoggi thing. Like the Khashoggi thing, it was, I mean, I don't think people would have taken it well had it happened at any time, but it happened at a really disadvantageous time for them internationally and especially with the American media because there was, you know, it, it, you could link it to like Trump's embrace of the uh, of Saudi Arabia, the way that he was sort of won over during his first visit there. Uh, it tied into this broader public adoration of journalists in America. Mm -hmm. It allowed like, you know, people like Jim Acosta to sort of like compare themselves to Khashoggi in this kind of sneaky <laughs> way. And it really like it was such a dumb move because they pissed off, you know, an incredibly useful group of people, American journalists, and they were painted into a corner for this time. But like you said, it really seems to have taken on this new, more sophisticated form, probably since like uh, China brokered that uh, detente, detente with Iran. Like that's everything seems to stem from that. And like uh, MBS himself, his rule, his era, it's, I guess it's sort of like a brain damaged version of uh, <laughs> King Faisal. It's the same time. It's like he has a similar ambition for both modernization and uh, moving their weight around in the region outside of the aegis of the United States, sort of moving independently of the United States more and more. But that Newcastle United thing in particular is so interesting because it adds to the image that MBS wants so badly, the image of like hyper competence. You can, you know, you can do whatever awful thing you want, whether it's, you know, killing people for tweets or um, the war in Yemen. If you have the appearance of someone who can get anything done very quickly. Oh, yes. And he, he, I think it's, the Newcastle is one is really, really interesting because, yeah, it was one of those moments where he immediately made himself inevitable 
really. The fact that they were able to complete this takeover despite everything that happened, despite all the human rights abuses and all the uproar that the media was uh, was putting up a fight in, in, in the United Kingdom and particularly over this topic. And the fact that it still ended up going through really showed that Mohammed bin Salman had almost strategized incorrectly to begin with when he went on his reform campaign and this might me this might be me looking in hindsight for him rather than what actually occurred here but i really think they focused so hard on the sports washing element to begin with they really thought you know we're going to take this soft power let's attract them slowly and lure them in approach to both sports and to the media in general which is when we saw this whole campaign the facade that was put up for Mohammed bin Salman but when he was actually caught in the act and he realized, all right, you know what, the jig is up and I can't, you know, can't really lie about this thing anymore. Well, he took a far more aggressive and direct approach, didn't he, with takeovers of actual sports teams. But he could have been planning this beforehand, sure, but it just goes to show you the evolution of the interest in sport. Another great example is their hostile takeover of the PGA Tour. I mean, I know everybody's calling it a merger, but let's be real, Felix. How is poaching top players and then litigating as aggressively as Saudi Arabia did, threatening antitrust lawsuits, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, that's really intimidating your stake the stakeholders in the PGA Tour leading to a hostile takeover. They made it basically inevitable. Again, I use that term because really that's how I feel about Saudi sports right now. We're in a position that no matter what you're facing, they're coming at you with more resources and far more ambition. And as you mentioned, a leader who really seems to think that he can emerge as a regional hegemon. Now, we can debate this topic for a while, Felix, because while I think had we had this conversation, say, in January or February 2023, right after the Iran deal was brokered, I would have been more confident in Mohammed bin Salman truly being able to take that take on that position but it's becoming more and more clear that he has a vision for Saudi and Saudi nationalism that doesn't necessarily include a Arab sort of nationalism or more or a more connect connectivity between between the region in that sense I don't think he really wants to lead the region as much as he wants to dominate it through Saudi Arabia so the Iran deal was was interesting because it showed that he was willing to be diplomatic. But a few weeks ago, Saudi Arabia welcomed the world to what they called Riyadh season, this big winter festival, this annual festival. And what they did is they started the event, they inaugurated it with a boxing match, one between former UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou and uh, WBO heavyweight boxing champion Tyson Fury. And this event, you want to talk about glitz and glamour and all that stuff. Saudi brought that in spades. They brought celebrities from around the world. You had Eminem, you had Kanye West, you had everybody you could think of was was Cristiano Ronaldo was sitting there in the front. It really was a who's who list. And the, 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 the ring, the boxing ring was brought out from under the ground. There was an opening ceremony for the match. They really put out all the stops. But here's the thing, they did that while the rest of the region was actually in basically a state of mourning, having cancelled all events because of the war in Gaza. Everybody else, including in Egypt, where I was at the time, had cancelled a film festival on the Red Sea, which would have, I mean, attracted less attention as a big boxing match to begin with. And they still cancelled it because they thought it wasn't really the time for us to be celebrating or to, hold, to be hosting these events. The entire region took that decision. And yet here's Saudi Arabia saying, no, 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 no. We try, we've been planning this for months. We're going ahead anyway. It was that level of selfishness that told me, no, MBS is in this for himself rather than in this to present even a facade that he is an Arab leader. He doesn't really care, I don't think, about. Right now, I believe that he'd see the current issues that taking place, the war in Gaza, the Palestinian cause as a nuisance and an obstacle rather than a pivotal objective of his rule or a pivotal, uh, you know, policy point at all, as a matter of fact. And we're really seeing that. And it was interesting that sports was that magnifying lens for this uh, incident. So that's currently how I feel about this. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like he did, he had that phone call with Raisi who Sure, I'm fucking up the pronunciation of his last name. The the president of Iran, which was it was a big deal in and of itself, mm -hmm. you know, just that they publicly had this call about Gaza, about the uh, about the Palestinian cause. But like, I I do agree with you that I get the sense from MBS, and 
pretty much every Saudi monarch after King Faisal that the Palestinian cause is more or less like a nuisance that they they have to pay a certain amount of lip service to it. They maybe will pay for the construction of something in Gaza every once in a while. Um, they'll, you know, issue a strongly worded statement about um, <laughs> settlements in the West Bank. But for the most part, it's really, like you said, like a, an unfortunate distraction for them. Well, uh, F- it- Faisal was like, he was really the only guy mm-hmm. who, who was like, okay, you know, I will make life harder for all of us based Here's, on how much I care about this. Oh, absolutely. He, this was a key issue for, for, for King Faisal. He was, was willing to cut off oil to, to the Western world, basically implementing his own form of sanctions against the West. And it absolutely crippled. It crippled the West, right? I mean, the UK had to go on like a three-day work week at one point, right? And he, and I mean, I think there were threats from the United States at the time that they were willing to bomb the oil fields. And uh, I think King Faisal responded with something along the lines of, we're, we were once a people who lived on, you know, goats and milk. And I, we can go back to goats and milk. That's perfectly fine. Here's the thing now, here's the thing now, Felix. I really don't think Saudi Arabia is willing to ever go back to the days of goats no, and milk. No, no way. That's <laughs> never going to happen. And I'll take this one step further. Mohammed bin Salman and his Vision 2030, you know, master plan, this, 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 this vision for a technocratic future for Saudi Arabia where it develops all these alternative economic sectors. Well, that requires investment and integration with the global economy, right? Even though a lot of this is them taking over entities, but they are heavily invested in the world. This is not something that they can just turn around and stop doing, right? That completely shuts down his own plans. So in many ways, his rise and his ambitions for his country are still tied to the rest of the world. He can't simply isolate himself anymore. So that leverage that they once had is completely gone and shows you how different they are as rulers, right? How different mm-hmm. Hamad bin Salman is and the different and the obstacles that he's going to face now. Yeah, it really, uh, the quote we always say on the show, the, uh, the Portis uh, quote, we're weaker than our fathers. We don't even look like them. <laughs> that's that's uh, MBS and Faisal, you know, like on the surface, two guys who are very invested in modernization and changing some of the rules and laws in the country. And most importantly, making this place that, you know, a lot of the people there didn't always feel like they were part of a nation, making them feel that way. I mean, I, I, I think that is an important distinction with the sports policy the national pride element with Saudi Arabia. Like it's, there is a sense among like people who watch Gulf politics that citizens of Saudi Arabia, they maybe sometimes didn't always feel like they were citizens of a nation in the way that like, you know, maybe English or like Turkish people would, but it seems to, it seems to lend some type of like national cohesion and pride. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Let me tell you, as somebody who grew up in the Middle East, right, between Egypt, I've lived in Bahrain for many years, which is this little tiny island kingdom just across from Saudi Arabia. And I also lived in Saudi Arabia. But when I lived in Bahrain, Bahrain was known as the sort of the most uh, liberal uh, of the the least conservative, let's say, of the of the Gulf states. It was basically a place where you could drink, very much like Dubai. It had that it had that sort of feel to it. So the Saudis would cross this causeway that connected. Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and every weekend, as as like you know, a young kid and a and an early teenager, I would see drones of these Saudis, droves and droves of these Saudis just flocking and, fl- and flooding the city, and they're just going into every bar they can and drinking as much as they possibly could. Right? It was almost something to be pitied. They couldn't do absolutely anything in their own country, so they were going everywhere else. And I'd see the same things in Egypt for years. You, if you told Egyptians it, to what they thought about Saudis, they tell you, oh, they're just you know they're always drunk and they're acting like assholes on the streets in Egypt. And that's because yeah, when they're when when you when you've been deprived to that extent, of course, once you start actually seeing what freedom looks like, that's how you're going to end up you know acting. It, it makes me think of you know the kids who grew up in a really isolated environment. They go to university and then they screw up in their first year in university because of that. Yeah. <laughs> it feels exactly like that's what's happening with with Saudi. So there's no doubt that there's growing national pride that now they feel like they are superior to other people. 
in that sense. They, they do. They feel like everything is now happening in Saudi Arabia. And to the extent I've heard some awful things from some, from, you know, Saudis and Emiratis saying, well, we can buy Egypt if we want to. That's how much they view themselves as superior, these countries now to others in the Arab region, right? So there's a massive shift in, in nationalism and pride in how they distinguish themselves from the rest of the region as well. If anything, I think the rivalry uh, is is primarily now between uh, Saudi, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar, because I think between the three of those countries, they think they can just own, flat out own the rest of the region through their checkbook diplomacy, right? But when we're talking simply about Saudi, it's definitely clear to me that even through sports, it's strengthening its nationalism. We're really seeing that in its decision through the public investment fund to fund and, and basically take over its domestic league. What Saudi Arabia did is they actually bought majority stakes in the four biggest clubs in Saudi Arabia, the four biggest football clubs, uh, between Al-Halal, Al-Nasr, uh, Al-Ahli. Those were the clubs that they invested in. That's, that's where you have seen this I- incredible... Uh, unprecedented drive to to bring in all these foreign stars to compete in the Saudi domestic league from Neymar to Ronaldo and the list goes on Karim Benzema they're trying to get Mohamed Salah from Egypt to go as well so that has really apart from it being the obvious you know bread and circuses for Saudi youth keeping them distracted because I mean half of the country's population is under the age of 35 that's a lot of people you have to keep entertained but apart from that, it's a great way for them to build this sort of group uh, uh, group unity and connectivity through through sports. Football really does that in the Arab world, and Saudi Arabia has always been a very successful, uh, uh, you know, competitor in football. It's actually one of the most successful countries in Asia, really, and in the Arab world too. They've won an incredible amount of Asian cups as well. Like between, I think there's Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and a handful of others that have ever done. Uh, this well, even though Egypt's in Africa. But uh, it was no surprise to me that they would re- rely on football like that, right? And then you had Ronaldo appearing in these ad campaigns for Al Nasr on Saudi, on Saudi National Day, where he was actually dressed in the Saudi thobe and, and was dancing a folkloric dance while holding a sword, like in a very folkloric style, basically embodying Saudi identity. As, a, as one of the biggest, most well-known individuals on the face of this earth, now Saudis, who for the most, for the vast majority of their lives have been deprived from the basic, you know, entertainment that we take for granted in the rest of the world, now get to see the world's top stars represent them and identify with them. That's a massive shift, which is why with Gen Z in particular, Mohammed bin Salman is extraordinarily popular, Felix. He really is. The generation coming up now, they absolutely adore him. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard that, that he was incredibly popular among young people. And I thought that was such a huge deal because traditionally the problem that most Saudi monarchs have is their their population of young men specifically. I mean, Saudi Arabia really since um, since the late 70s, they did sort of have a policy of what they would do with angry young men, mm-hmm. which is to, you know, take the particularly religiously devout ones and, you know, okay, you go to Afghanistan or you go to the Caucasus or you, you, you go take part in whatever, you know, whatever regional strategy and act as our proxies and fight over there and don't stay here and do anything crazy like take over the Grand Mosque. But <laughs> having a monarch who, like, you know, young people and young men, especially, especially love is again, I think Faisal would be the last guy who kind of had it like that. And even then Faisal had to contend with things that Hamad bin Salman doesn't, right? He had to contend with dissenting factions within his own family, right? He had to like yeah. contend with the fact that the religious authority actually had a lot more control and sway then than they do under Hamad bin Salman. So those things alone actually make it so that Faisal had his hands tied a little bit to the extent that, I mean, he was assassinated at the end of the day when he did go and do what he thought was right. He was assassinated for it. And granted, he was also assassinated by a member of the royal family. So Saudi Arabia has a very interesting history. I don't think it's, in any, it's facing any of these types of uh, threats coming up now. The fact that Mohammed bin Salman was able to 
uh, not only rise the way he did, basically through what can only be described at this point as a palace coup, working his mm-hmm. way up through these various positions, and in the end, actually uh, leading a, a a mass crackdown, what they called was a crackdown on corruption, but it was really a way to uh, eliminate all forms of dissent and, and solidify and consolidate his power when he arrested and threw tycoons, royal family members, etc., into the Ritz-Carlton for over a year. Some were tortured, some were psychologically abused, and in the end, a lot had to transfer their assets over to the state. And guess, Felix, where a lot of those assets went? To the public investment fund. <laughs> and from there, way back into investing in sports. So even the money, when people are like, oh, Saudi has changed, Saudi has changed, understand that the money you, you that, that, that's, that's being offered to you by Saudi Arabia to begin with is blood money. If it's not blood money, it was, it was corrupt money before that. It's, it's, it's one of those situations, right? But again, when you have the, the United States has this thing, especially with its with its with its sports and its corporations in general. This unbelievable urge to always uh, pursue maximum profit at all expense. Well, in that case, that's always going to lead you into the hands of people like Mohammed bin Salman, and that's why Felix, I don't think sports washing really matters to him anymore because yeah. he can really do whatever he wants, and as long as he flashes that money, people are going to come at him. People are going to keep coming. That's just how it works, unless there's any regulation to stop it. But I don't even think that kind of regulation is going to work. We're seeing that attempted with the PGA Tour right now, where you actually have a U.S. Senate subcommittee investigating the merger right now. And uh, I, 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 I dare say I don't think it's really going to come to any anything in the end. And honestly, we don't know if this merger is going to go through because it has until the end of next month. So that in itself could collapse. But... It still feels like Saudi has the upper hand here, or at least they have showed their hand into what they're actually capable of doing, which is bringing about the complete capitulation of a U.S. pastime just because they can. I mean, they initially wanted to go into partnership with the PGA, Felix. They came and approached the PGA saying, hey, we'd just like to invest in you guys and we'd like to host more events and stuff like that. And the PGA said, yeah, no thanks, not interested. I bet they think that's a big mistake now. Bet they wish they could take that one back because <laughs> Saudi was like, "Oh, it's going to be like it's going to be like that." Well, yeah, they just started their own league, poached the players, and ended up forcing a takeover. So we could see that in combat sports as well. Speaking of stuff like this, right? Like the UFC, which has never seen any sort of competition, has competing entities. At least, like it has other MMA organizations in its sphere, like the Professional Fighters League. And the Professional Fighters League is the organization that actually signed Francis Ngannou former UFC heavyweight champion when he became a free agent. They also got a $100 million investment from Saudi Arabia, a minority stake that was uh, bought by the public investment fund or a subsidiary of the public investment fund. And not that the two worlds are exactly the same. Mind you, they are all independent contractors as well in uh, in both the PGA and, uh, and, and the UFC. I don't think it's exactly the same. I think the UFC has far more... Uh, stringent and 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 complex contracts for people to get out of but i think if saudi arabia really wants to it could put up a fight here and it has the money to put up a fight and i don't think the ufc understands what it's facing here yeah no absolutely i mean for all intents and purposes they would be going up against someone who has virtually unlimited resources going back a little bit um, you brought up the rivalry uh, mm-hmm. between uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Qatar. There's sort of this sense in Gulf politics that the UAE is they're able to get away with a lot more than Saudi Arabia. Right. <laughs> like the the war in Yemen, which was like this horrible, awful conflict where um, the Gulf, the Gulf coalition was the Gulf coalition was humiliated at fair bit like mm-hmm. you know generals were killed um they uh would just be a, a, unable to take any territory for the longest time that was sort of thought of as a saudi thing more than anything even though the uae uh some people even think that they instigated it and the uae was just as culpable as the saudis they were kind of the leaders of that coalition Um, there's been sort of like a growing bitterness between both them and Saudi Arabia, sort of related to like the differing factions Mm -hmm. that the two countries backed in Syria, 
but also um, the U- the UAE when they took over Socotra, that island uh, off of Yemen, things seemed to really take a turn after that. Like the Saudis did seem to become very resentful after that. Could you talk about how the UAE strategy with sports is? There's a lot less bombast, and it sort of mirrors the, uh, I guess, s- more subtle style of Emirati international politics. Well, it certainly does. First of all, you're absolutely right that, that the United Arab Emirates doesn't get anywhere near the flag that Saudi does. It's very similar to, I like to compare it to sometimes the United States and Canada. Canada gets away with pretty much anything because it's got it's got the United States making all this noise and getting all the attention. But Canada is extraordinarily controversial as well and has done some really horrific things from its treatment to indigenous folks to, uh, to et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So United Arab Emirates really is not, is not much different. As a matter of fact, you really mention it right there with Yemen. If anything, Saudi Arabia has been trying to pull out of this Yemen conflict, and guess who is continuing to instigate it? It's the it's the coalition that's backed, or it's the entity that's backed by the United Arab Emirates, because they're now on opposing sides of this war. So, I think for the longest time, the United Arab Emirates has been able to get away with a lot, and it's partly because of two reasons. First of all, they are. It's just like you said, they're not as bombastic as uh, as Mohammed bin Salman, they definitely weren't as interested in the limelight in the same way either. I mean, this is a country that has a self-power council. <laughs> they are well aware of what they are working with here, and they've been doing it for a couple of decades now. By the way, that self-power council is uh, chaired by Sheikh Mansour, the younger brother of Sheikh, uh, of Sheikh, of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, who is the current... Uh, uh, the, the current leader of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, yeah, he's the uh, president of the UAE. Exactly, the current president of the UAE. And uh, Sheikh Mansour is actually the owner of Manchester City, the football club that has been doing spectacularly well in the Premier League and has won the United Arab Emirates this reputation of uh, shrewd business decisions and shrewd investment strategies to the point that the UAE has been even able to buy up land cheap in Manchester itself because it has convinced the council, the city council in Manchester, that it as an entity is working to the benefit of the community. It has done so much to invest in Manchester City to improve, you know, the stadium, to improve the surrounding area. So, of course, why not give them land for cheap? Well, it turns out what Abu Dhabi actually did with that land was it. You know, it ended up buying it very cheap, as I mentioned, and building these really expensive uh, properties that they just rented themselves and they take the profits for. It did nothing to benefit actual Manchester itself. And a big report thereafter said that, you know, Manchester City Council really like, you know, really shit the bed with that decision. Because at the end of the day, it was just an example of gentrification. At the end of the day, the United Arab Emirates sees not only just an opportunity to improve its own image, but it now truly sees massive investment opportunities. The UAE, unlike Saudi Arabia, will ha- eventually run into the issue far quicker of running out of oil. Its investments are a lot more calculated, and they are p- investing in all sorts of things around the world. And this goes really beyond sports as well. In Egypt, actually, one of the big, really uh, major controversies that happened the last year, I remember when I was just there, uh, this was one of those big talking points, was that the United Arab Emirates had leased or bought, or I, it was really difficult to, to work out the details, the in Egypt's national zoo. And they were actually about to tear it down and turn it into an open-air safari in the middle of Cairo, just because they could, just because they could, you know? <laughs> it's just ridiculous it's things incredible. like that and it will work and it will make them money and they've bought up chunks of land in Egypt and who knows what they're going to be doing with this land but I mean we're in a position as, as a country Egypt that's in such a debt crisis right now that our president our current military dictators happily you know selling everything off and the UAE is there to to snag it up and this is a strategy they've applied elsewhere right the United Arab Emirates unlike Saudi Arabia is not a football country Believe it or not, I'd say they're more combat sports than any other country in the region. Their national sport is jiu-jitsu. They have been applying jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, as soft power since the early 2000s. As a matter of fact, Sheikh Tahnoun. Now, Sheikh Tahnoun, you might know him and you might be familiar with him as sort of the spy chief of the United Arab Emirates. Well, guess what? He's actually also known as the UAE's jiu-jitsu spiritual leader. 
basically. Because in 1993, when he was in San Diego studying in university, he watched the very first UFC event, fell in love with it, and started training jiu-jitsu. And guess who he ended up training with? Henzo Gracie. <laughs> so him and Henzo Gracie have had this incredible friendship since then. And he went on, uh, he returned to the United Arab Emirates, told his brother, Mohammed bin Zayed, and all his other brothers about this incredible sport he had discovered, how wonderful it was. He started building up these entities, these sports federations, the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, which now hosts the most prestigious jiu-jitsu tournaments in the world. They ended up making the sport mandatory in public curriculums in some of the Emirates. And also mandatory in police uh, training and in the military. They ended up bringing in tons of Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, specialists and, and trainers to come and teach people in the United Arab Emirates, building this great cultural bond between the UAE and Brazil to the point that Lula, the president of Brazil, was actually just in the UAE a few months ago celebrating Hamad bin Zayed for his influence in jiu-jitsu. In many ways, the jiu-jitsu country is not Brazil, despite it being BJJ, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's actually the UAE. And they've used it in a variety of different ways, like I just said, right? So their, their soft power, their sports washing strategy, however you want to refer to this, is very subtle, very complex. And it's quite insidious as well when you really think about it, because you, you might not even know it's really happening. And that relationship with the WWE, with not WWE, sorry, with the UFC I'll give this as a last example, Felix, as you'll be surprised by this one, is another great one here because while it was promoted for a while during the pandemic, the UFC used to host these Fight Island events in Abu Dhabi. And at the time, I thought of it really as just this, you know, tourism opportunity for the UAE. You know, that was what I was used to seeing here. I'm like, okay, they're playing this as a tourism play. And I wrote the article as such. Then at one point, I saw that Dana White was wearing a very strange t-shirt I had never seen before. And... It was an AI company, and it was a UAE AI company that was actually invested in all sorts of spy software, working with Israel, working with all these other entities with the Emirates to present all this different uh, AI-influenced spy technology. And that was now being promoted on a UFC broadcast. <laughs> That's how That's subtle it was. Incredible. Safe to say, after I wrote the article about it, they did not promote it again. One of the rare times that I think the UFC actually responded to something I did. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of amazing that for e even for them, they're like, "Oh, this looks really bad." <laughs> oh yeah, every once in a while they'll surprise you. It seems they still have <laughs> limits. We got a call somewhere around April uh, that Dana has a dream. Uh, to, to create a fight island. It was in the back of his mind that nowhere else in the world could have delivered such a massive event with uh, all the operational uh, elements coming together as we see uh, around us uh, than Abu Dhabi. Well, this, this actually segues nicely into our uh, final topic because um, you've written extensively about uh, uh, Ramzan Kadarov and Ahmed Fight Club the UAE as like a host nation for UFC events, obviously, like you mentioned that like jujitsu and MMA have this incredible cultural purchase inside the UAE, but hosting events there sort of serves this dual function because mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, if you're Katarov and you are personally under a sanctions regime by the United States treasury and, now even stricter ones uh, from the EU and newer ones from the U.S. since the start of the Ukrainian war, you can still go to the UAE. You're not going to run into any trouble there. Uh, any fighters that are part of Ahmed Fight Club, uh, they will have no trouble getting visas. There's a mm -hmm. long friendship between uh, Chechen leadership and uh, the Emirates. Well, you absolutely said this. Yeah, you, you, you made the point right there. And honestly, it surprises me, Felix, that the UFC didn't catch on sooner, that they could dodge the U.S. sanctions by simply hosting all these Ahmad fighters in Abu Dhabi, which is what they did with their with their with a recent event, UFC 294. That event featured so many Kadyrov affiliated fighters, so many of them, including, of course, his prize puppet, Hamza Chemaev. Right? Like that's the big one right there. But what was also interesting to see is that Kadyrov's children 
Kedero's three sons, well, two of the three sons, were in attendance as well. Not just in attendance, they were Hamza Chimayev's corner men. They were backstage with him. They were dressed in UFC attire. They came out, you know, they stood on the octagon. The whole nine yards as if they were actually his corner men. This is how blatant it is, the Kadyrov's presence. And of course, previously over the years, Kadyrov himself has attended UFC events in Abu Dhabi. He attended one like in the front row. And guess who he was standing by? The Minister of Tolerance of the United Arab Emirates. Talk about the irony of that situation. <laughs> so maybe the, maybe he learned something. Who's oh, to say? <laughs> absolutely. Oh, yeah. And you can tell they had lots to talk about. But uh, this, and I believe afterwards, Kadyrov posted this montage of, of Hamza Chemaev leaving the, the event in Abu Dhabi and going back to a house in, in what appeared to be Jumeirah in Dubai, from, from what I could see. And Kadyrov was standing there. So Kadyrov was actually there at this point as well. So he was still having no issues despite the ongoing war, despite anything, m- traveling from Chechnya and landing in the United Arab Emirates for nothing other than to just be present for a Hamza Chemaev fight. He still sees the UFC as this fantastic marketing opportunity for himself. You want to talk about classic sports washing? Kadyrov really embodies that when it comes to the to the UFC. He's been able to use it as a means to completely make sports fans believe that he's just this you know, magnanimous uh, patron for the sport, really, and somebody who is standing in support of these Muslim MMA fighters, right? You've got, you've, you've got plenty of examples of that, but really it goes far beyond it, I think. I mentioned his kids, and I'm not going to tell you about six years of what I've been doing covering Ramzan Kadyrov, but I'll tell you what he's been doing this year alone that I think you'll find very interesting. We're starting actually with December 2022. One of his sons, his this, this kid named Ali, uh, his, his middle child, he decided he wanted to become a professional fighter. And for months, he had been training with Hamza Chimaev. Like they'd actually travel, go see other UFC fighters and train with them as if he was an actual fighter, right? And this would all get posted on Instagram and Kadyrov would promote it and talk about how, look at my son, the fighter, and eventually, this kid debuts for Kadyrov's own promotion, Absolute Championship Ahmed. Of course, he's debuting in Kadyrov's promotion and takes part in this extremely obviously fixed fight and wins. And here was what I called an example of Kadyrov using this dynastic propaganda. He's using MMA as a way to say, look, my offspring are strong. And this dynasty, this legacy I will leave is going to continue to rule Chechnya onwards and onwards. He is not only he hasn't only built himself a cult of personality, he's built one for the entire Kadyrov clan and combat sports play such a crucial role in that. I'll take this one step further for you Felix. A few months later, he posted a video of his other son, Adam. Now, Adam is uh, has also been regularly seen and spotted uh, at UFC events. As a matter of fact, every time Kamaru Usman, uh, the former UFC champion, visited Chechnya, he would do so because it was Adam's birthday and, and, and he was Adam's favorite fighter. So he was always going because it was this one Kadir of Kids uh, uh, invitation. So Adam had gotten into some hot water in Russia, let's say, because Kadyrov had posted a video of him clearly beating up a... Russian prisoner who had been accused of burning a Quran. And of course, Kadyrov saw this as an opportunity not only to present himself as the savior of Islam and protector of Islam by saying, nobody shall burn a Quran on my watch, but it was also an opportunity for him to showcase how Adam has evolved as an MMA fighter because most of the assault in the video was basically an MMA thing. He was body, you saw body kicks, you know, liver shots, punches to the head. The way Adam was fighting was clearly somebody who had been trained. And that added another brutal and sick layer to the whole thing, really, when you think about it, right? Like, this is how he's utilizing the sport beyond what you see in a UFC cage, beyond the average example of sports washing, right? And the people who are training these kids are UFC stars, like Hamza Chemaev. And what blows my mind is that Hamza Chemaev is clearly going the way of his predecessor, Abu Abdul Abd Karim Edelov. And I don't know if you if you've heard of what happened to Abdul Karim Edelov. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is 
shocking. <laughs> yes, really this, shocking. this was definitely, listen, I had gone through a period, honestly, I promise you, where I wasn't writing about Ramzan Kadyrov. Listen, I moved on. You saw me. We're talking about Saudi. We're talking about all these things. The fucker just keeps doing crazy shit and brings me right back in, right? And this was really one of those. So, so I'll explain to your listeners. Abdul Karim Edelov was sort of the glorified babysitter before Hamza Chemaya, the glorified babysitter to the, you know, the Kadyrov princelings. And he was also a UFC fighter. He fought for the UFC once before he ended up getting suspended for steroid use, I believe. Uh, it was either steroids or it was meldonium. It was something along those lines. Anyway, it was performance-enhancing drugs. He never ended up fighting for the UFC again. Instead, he went on to become this nanny for the Kadyrov kids. And as a nanny... He would, you know, take them to Quran sessions. He would, he would he'd basically live with them. He'd take them around everywhere. He was their guardian and protector. And from that, Kadyrov ended up eventually giving him a promotion. He made him deputy prime minister of Chechnya. Because apparently, you know, the trajectory of politics in Chechnya is you go from nanny to, you know, deputy prime minister. That's a very natural progression. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, and, and as the war broke out, right, and as Russia invades Ukraine, you've got... Uh, pictures of Abdul Karim Edelov standing alongside uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, and uh, he's he's basically you know armed to the gills, and he's he's wearing these bulletproof vests. He looks like he's supposed to be a soldier going out to battle, but he never does. At no point does he ever go to the front lines or anything like that. He just sticks around Kadyrov. But at some point, a few months later, word breaks out that he has sort of fallen out of favor and is no longer in the inner circle. Then. He's simply removed from his position as deputy prime minister. There's just an announcement that goes up that says Abdul Karim Edelov is no longer serving in this position. A few weeks later, we get word that he's dead. How he has died, Felix, remains one of the big mysteries <laughs> when it comes to reporting on Kadyrov. And unfortunately, it's not as if we can... There aren't many sources who are willing to talk anymore. Even my sources dry up on topics like this. And it's very hard to get anything transparently figured out when it comes to Kadira. But there are two prevailing stories that have come out. One of them is that Kadira, that, that Abdul Karim Edelov pissed off one of Kadyrov's relatives, who happened to be more influential than him, tried to extort him at one point, and that's what led to him getting killed. The other story, I'll admit, is a little more interesting, and it actually involves one of Kadyrov's kids, Adam. It turns out that at one point, they were in Dubai together. It was Adam, Adam's bodyguard, and uh, Abdul Karim Edelov. And uh, they had some drugs on them, some sort of amphetamines that they had, which, by the way, these things are quite popular in Chechnya. Like, there's a l far more drug abuse that goes on amongst these uh, Kadyrov's ruling elite than they'd like to let on. So, you know, Abdul Karim Edelov and his other bodyguard have these drugs on them. Adam insists that he wants some, and they give him. And he just insists then thereafter that he wants to drive. So they let this 15-year-old kid drive. He gets into a car accident and kills a couple of people. And this, leads to, and this leads to a massive issue that leads to him getting back. They have to get him sent back to Chechnya. Kadyrov flips out that, he's, that this has happened. And yeah, he gets rid of the evidence being Abdul Karim Edelov and the bodyguard, which, by the way, the bodyguard was also killed. So, oh yeah, it's God. a really, truly wild, wild story. And unfortunately, this is very difficult to verify beyond the, the extent that I went to in the articles that I've written on this so far. And, and we're quite comfortable. I mean, The Guardian was comfortable enough with the information we had at the time to go forward with the story as well. And we're quite confident that he is absolutely dead. But as to exactly what happened, we really may never know, Felix. But it's yet another example of this bizarre MMA related saga when it comes to Ramzan Kadyrov. It's really amazing how like every <laughs> every brutal regime in modern history is just really into uppers. I've oh. always found that to be funny. But um I was I I wanted to ask you about a uh, uh, well, I mean, no one knows that this guy is dead or alive. I mean, if I had to bet, I would probably say dead. But um, if you knew about the uh, boxer who disappeared, uh, uh, Umar Sal Salimov. No, unfortunately, even the the Chechen, this was reported actually by, by, by some of the Chechen dissidents that run these anonymous accounts on Telegram. And they've been remarkably accurate with a lot of these reports. And the report was that sort of there was a 
a, a attack on one of the villages where Kadyrov forces, uh, security forces came and, took, and kidnapped a bunch of the people who lived in a certain village. And one of these people was that boxer that you just mentioned, right, Umar? And this is a boxer that's represented by Bob Arum. And Bob Arum has not mentioned anything with regards to this boxer that's just gone missing off the face of this earth. And since the, since I've posted my article about him going missing, there have been, there's been absolutely no mention of him potentially being still alive. It is possible he's still being detained, but it's also very very possible that he has died. But really, this is what this is something that I think we need to emphasize when it comes to Ramzan Kadyrov. He may present his top fighters as these elite figures, right, and elevate them to elite status in society. But that's only when they're beneficial to him. Right at the end of the day, I think he views everybody as expendable in this yeah. in these cases. He really absolutely does, and it's so clear to me that he's using his Fight Club as a sort of recruitment ground. And this is another article I had posted uh, around this around the time of, of of the war when the war broke out. He's actually using his Fight Club as recruitment ground for the war. So basically, Felix, it just basically comes down to if you're not if you're a Chechen MMA fighter and you're not good enough. To represent Kadyrov in the cage, then you're absolutely good enough to die for him on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. Just to uh, just so people know, the boxer that we just spoke about, um, no one has heard from him since I September 2022. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One last thing I was curious about that I wanted to ask you is um, you've noted how like a, a lot of uh, active roster UFC fighters and very popular former UFC roster fighters like Frank Mir uh, have gone on these like extensive paid junkets in <laughs> Chechnya as, as Kadyrov's guest. I'm assuming that like if they tried to do that now, if you're an American fighter who tried to do that now, you would at the very least get like a pretty heavy fine. And I think you'd probably go to prison now. Right, like for breaking Man, I, U.S. Treasury sanctions. I wish that was true, Felix. I wish that was true. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I'm this. Listen, this might be me being skeptical, but honestly, even from our, our reporting in the New York Times, we did two pieces on the specifically the 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 Kadyrov sanctions and how they factor into the UFC. And the conclusion we came to really is that a unless the treasury is really determined to enforce these sanctions and and go through the 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 effort of of verifying these things there's really almost no consequences that these fighters will face case in point when when Justin Gaethje, Kamaru Usman and Henry Cejudo all former UFC champions by the way went to test you know firearms at the Russian Special Forces University which is where Chechnya like it's a, it's a facility in Chechnya that trains soldiers for this specific war right so this was during the war that was already taking place they were there testing out firearms and posing for the propaganda and then they came back to the United States and guess what Justin Gaethje, Kamaru Usman they've all been fighting since then not a fine not a care in the world and they did this publicly in front of everybody. And trust me, we reached out to the State Department repeatedly and the Treasury, and they each notified us that they were very aware of what was happening. They were very aware, but they did not want to discuss the matter further. Here's what I think has happened. I think the UFC has finally taken the decision to start moving a lot of these, at least Ahmed-related fighters, these Chechens, onto into Abu Dhabi because I think they're going to start facing visa issues. Now, that's probably what has happened with Hamza Chimaev. I've gotten multiple, let's say, reports that that suggest that Ramza, that Hamza Chimaev is currently unable to get a visa into the United States. This is something that U.S. authorities, the State Department, etc., will not confirm because they never discuss the status of, of somebody's visa, and they're not willing to disclose information like that in public, unfortunately. But it appears to me that Hamza Chimaev is struggling to get a visa. And I think that's what's going to happen to any foreign national who's going to be trying to get into the U.S. They're going to struggle because of that relationship to Kadyrov. As for the U.S.-based fighters, you'd think it would be so easy to get, to you know, it would be so clear. But unfortunately, when it comes to Treasury sanctions, since they're financial sanctions, they have to now guarantee that these fighters earned their money first of all they'd have to prove that they got that they were paid and then they would have to trace that money back to the exact entities that are on the sanctions list 
And that's where things get even more complicated, right? So the more I learned about this, unfortunately, the more I learned about this, the more I realized, oh, so unless the U.S. is absolutely, utterly determined to to impose these sanctions on them and to, and to, to apply them, sorry, rather than just impose them, to actually go ahead and apply them, then nothing's going to really change. Truly. I think right now if Kamaru Usman goes again to, to Chechnya, I think he comes back out of this just fine, apart from the attention he'll get online. It might, this might be, you know, fourth times, you know, he's gone three times already. So maybe it's the fourth time where he finally gets the fine. <laughs> I just, that's just so crazy to me because like, I don't know, maybe, I guess this is like the difference between me and like a successful MMA fighter, but I'm such a pussy that like, <laughs> when I go through like customs in Canada, I'm like, oh no, are they going to take my vape stuff? <laughs> and like 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 if i was violating u.s sanctions all i would be thinking about is like mark rich and like dying in federal prison but i, I guess if like they have to find the actual entity and there are all these ways to like obscure that yeah i i, I guess it yeah has, it's a lot harder it has than worked. it seems it has worked though you make a great point because it's the intimidation it's the scaring off people from doing it by sanctioning the entities that usually makes it effective to begin with that's what i've actually understood from lawyers who've worked on like sanctions cases regularly they're like yeah usually people back off immediately as soon as somebody's listed on the sanctions list which by the way we technically have seen with regards to kadirov a we're seeing far less mention of him especially in english on a ufc broadcast that i believe is pressure from the ufc itself trying to slowly distance itself from obvious representations of Ahmed and Kadyrov on the broadcast, uh, except I guess in in Abu Dhabi, right? So that that's 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 one clear example for me. I think that uh, uh, that it's changed. Other than that, I also think that once upon a time we used to see you know Better Hari, Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson regularly go to Chechnya. None of them are making trips anymore, are they? It's been a few years since Kadyrov has had a major celebrity who has not been a UFC fighter. So to an extent, they're starting to work. They've been able to scare off the people who have the most to lose. Unfortunately, I don't think MMA fighters count as the ones with the most to lose. We talked about exploitative labor earlier. I really think, you know, maybe not. Well, let's not talk about Kamaru and Justin and them who've made good money, let's say. But a lot of people will be enticed by the money that, that Kadyrov offers. And for some people, it could be life changing. Some of those MMA fighters, yeah, you know, 100, 500 grand, that matters to them, right? So in a way that it would never matter to a LeBron James or a Mike Tyson anymore or a Floyd Mayweather, right? So, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where that's the, the people who are going are the people who are still desperate enough to go. Yeah, and that unfortunately is a lot of fighters. I mean, mm -hmm. when you were talking about um, Abu Dhabi's like early investment in the sport, I thought like you know what what a great thing that is for them because like investing in individual fighters and like professional grapplers, you can buy them for a song like compared mm -hmm. to investing in you know football clubs and stuff. But oh yeah, uh, yeah, it's. Damn, I, I, I'm still stuck on that. Just like, I, I guess MMA fighters don't know about the Mark Rich case. I, I'm just still amazed by that. But, um, Kareem, this has been amazing. Um, we will not wait another six years for the next time to have you back on. I cannot believe it was six years, but, um, if people want to find uh, find more of your reporting, where should they go? Well, I'm still on I'm still on Twitter at Zidane Sports. You can also find my work on my newsletter. At this point, really, it's a media outlet, uh, SportsPolitica.news, and you'll also find me still regularly reporting for outlets like the Guardian and the New York Times. So I'm still everywhere, Felix. <laughs> Amazing! I am I am a actual subscriber to Sports Politica. Yes, you I are. highly Thank endorse you. it. My <laughs> Thank you very no, much. my pleasure. We will put links to all of that in the description. Uh, Kareem, thank you so much. Uh, that was awesome, Phil.